right. Stuff. stuff we've already talked some about. We've already talked a whole lot about molecular geometry, right? You had two and a half hours of molecular geometry last week in lab. So we're just going to zip right through the slides on molecular geometry because you've already heard all that stuff, right? Yay! So we don't have to go through it again. All right, you also have heard a smidge about bonding. We talked about nomenclature. I personally feel I was going to write a class about that. This could be a chapter that I would much sooner in the curriculum, probably around the idea of nomenclature, because the type of bond that goes on between molecules dictates a whole lot about what kind of things that molecule or that atom does in the context of physical and chemical characteristics. All right, so a lot of this stuff you've already seen and we've already discussed, but I want to kind of remind you that we also have this to think about. That's when we have the types of bonds, right, we've got something that is an ionic compound. An ionic compound is a three-dimensional structure. It repeats itself. In this case, I think this is cesium chloride, which is CSCl3, the overall molecular structure. You can see that it is in three dimensions, a repeating crystalline structure. These are usually solids at room temperature. They don't conduct energy well, and most of them are soluble when we put them in water. Right? We take them apart and we dissociate them, so we'll have those discussions when we're talking about ionic compounds. Ionic compounds if you recall, are made of metal, non-metal combinations. So something from the left-hand side of the stair step, something from the right-hand side of the stair step, combined together to make an ionic bond that is this crystal structure. Now, in comparison to an ionic bond, which is one from each side, we have molecules, true molecules, that we talked about last week in lab. Like this particular molecule, this is carbon dioxide molecule, CO2, and you've got double bonds between the carbon and the oxygen in carbon dioxide. We also have a water molecule. Now, the electron geometry of water molecule is what? What do we call the electron geometry of this thing? No, that's the molecular geometry of the The electron geometry is tetrahedral, which to me it never made sense when I was an undergrad why a molecule of water was bent. I thought it should be linear. But now we know why it's bent because you've got two pairs of non bonded electrons sticking out on this side of the molecule, which makes this side very cool. Negative, this side very positive, so it's a very cool in the molecule. Okay, today's lecture we're going to be talking about both ionic and molecular compounds, but I wanted to review with you what it is that we normally see when we talk about ionic versus molecular compounds because those are things that are different and they have different chemical characters. Okay, so our bonds are made when there's an electron, it's the electron redox is going on, you've got electrons flying around. And once that happens, once you've got a cation and an anion attracted to each other, that's what holds the compound together. It's what's called the electrostatic attraction. Called right? a dual. Opposites attract. The positive ion and negative ion are attracted to each other. And so that's what holds the compound together. It's the transfer electrons that creates this electrostatic attraction. Covalent bonds are um, true molecules are different. They don't give away or accept electrons, they share the electrons. Now, they may share those electrons equally if their electronegativities are the same, or they may share them unequally if their electronegativities of the particular bond are different. And finally, we, we discussed briefly in this chapter metallic bonds. Metallic bonds aren't a true bond like an ionic or a covalent bond. It doesn't require the type of energy requirement that is necessary to separate ionic or covalent bonds. Metallic bonds are much easier to separate. Metallic bonds are sort of like a group of jugglers, all the same. Everybody in their very skilled juggler, they can juggle three or four or five or even six objects at once. And that's how they enter the room with three. As you walk around, my bump into somebody, they might at some point get four or five of those things to general, but then it eventually evens out and everybody has somewhere between three or four. Well, that's how metals work. Metal bonding is not true bonding. It's like a group of electrons sort of communally shared, right, between the metal. And that's what makes electrical conductivity so easy in a metal is because the electrons are already held loosely and they move easily. All right, so ionic bonding is what we're going to talk about first. And if we look at the idea of ionic bonding, ionic bonding is when the non-metal, first of all, loses an electron, or excuse me, the metal loses an electron. So if we were going to depict that using symbolic meanings, 
and discuss what happens in terms of the energetics, we could say, all right, that's sodium chloride. In order to make sodium chloride, we have a sodium ion, or a sodium atom that changes into a sodium ion and at that time releases an electron. And the energetics of this bonding tell us that there is this idea of ionization energy, that to remove that first electron from sodium is going to cost us some energy per mole. So if I have a mole of sodium atoms, 6.02 times 10 to the 29 atoms of sodium, and I want to rip an electron off of all of that bundle of atoms, I'm going to have to have some energy to do that. We would all agree that that's true. You got to add some energy into the equation. All right. Conversely, when chlorine accepts that electron, now the sign of the energetics of this acceptance has changed, and now it is an exothermic reaction. So if we wanted to depict this symbolically, we could write an equation. And we could say, all right, chlorine atom grabs an electron and becomes a chloride. Ion, the energetics of this particular one is negative 349 kilojoules per mole. Well, all right. Well, that looks like kind of the Hess's law sort of idea, right? The amount of energy costs you to take the electron, the amount of energy that you receive. When I add those two together, what's going to be the overall sign of my enthalpy of this reaction? It's going to be positive value, but that's not true. It is not. An endothermic reaction. In fact, it's absolutely the opposite. When I take sodium metal, which, or excuse me, yep, there's sodium metal down at the bottom of this test tube here. I've got some chlorine gas in this test tube. The sodium metal's at the bottom. They've taken a hunk of the sodium metal out from under the kerosene, like you saw in the video um, Monday. They put it in the bottom of the test tube. They exposed it to some chlorine gas, allowed the sodium and the chlorine to come together to make salt. And it's super de duper exothermic. It gets so hot that a normal test tube probably couldn't even hold it, it would crack and burst and shatter. But once again, does that make sense based on this idea? We just decided that when I add this very large positive value and this smaller negative value, that my enthalpy for the overall reaction should be positive, which means it should be endothermic, right? But that's not true. It's very exothermic. So there's something going on here that we can't explain necessarily just by adding and subtracting the cost of electrons. And that's what we call the energetics of bonding. This idea of the energetics of bonding is not just what it costs to turn the electrons and what you get back when the electron is received. There has to be a third piece of the puzzle, which is this electrostatic interaction between the sodium and the chlorine ions once they form the compound that is sodium chloride. And this last piece of the puzzle is what we call lattice energy. All right, remember the structure of an ionic compound looks more like a lattice structure. I'm going to remind you here. Here's the structure of our ionic compound. That's why they call it a lattice. It's a repeating crystal structure that goes in three directions, x, y, and z axis. So this is our crystal, right? All ionic compounds, when they're in solid state, form crystals. And this is the lattice structure of that particular crystal. So when we discuss the lattice energy, that means how much energy is it going to take you to break up one mole of that particular type of compound, meaning if you have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd units of that thing, how much energy is it going to take you to break that up? Well, that's given to us with this idea of Coulomb's law. Now, Coulomb's law, I'm going to pull up this and we're going to talk about the variables. Um, Coulomb's law. The E, let's see, what do they use for the lattice energy value? E electrical. Okay. So E electrical, this is the idea of lattice energy. This is Coulomb's law. 
Lattice energy, the amount of energy, and kilojoules per mole to <coughs> ionize one mole of compound. So how much is it going to take you to break it up? The lattice energy is equal to K, which is Coulomb's constant. What is a constant? What does that mean? It's a number that doesn't change. So the actual value of the number at this point in the game is not super important. Just that you know that it's a number that doesn't change. All right? So it's not affecting the rest of the mathematics of this particular equation. So we know that K, which is Coulomb's constant, doesn't change. And K is proportional to the product of Q1, Q2 divided by D. So let's talk about what Q1 and Q2 are, as well as what D. I'm looking at this particular equation, Coulomb's law, the variables Q1 and Q2, those are the charges on the component ions in the compound. D is the distance between the nucleus. So you can see that all of our training at this point leads us to this idea that we can discuss Coulomb's law. We know the charges on the component ions are based on whether they're metals or non-metals, right? Mm -hmm. So something like magnesium is going to have a plus two, chlorine is going to have a minus one charge. D is the distance between the nuclei, and astronomers would call that distance angstrom. In chemistry, we generally use nanometers, so it's a very, very tiny distance. This idea comes into play because now we can compare the sizes of the atoms, right? Just like in the question from the quiz that you just had, which one of the atoms would be the closest together versus which ones would be the furthest apart? This idea of distance now, we need to think about in terms of how that's going to affect the amount of energy that it takes to break up a compound. So let's compare something using this idea of Coulomb's law. Let's use sodium chloride, which we call table salt, and calcium chloride, which is called road salt. Those of you that might be from the Midwest or back east, they don't put sodium chloride on the roads. They actually put calcium chloride on the roads. So this is table salt. This is road salt. So those are very common production. Easy to get hold of, common salts that we see every day in our lives. Let's think about the amount of energy it would take to break this up versus the amount of energy to take it and break it. This up. Those of you that have done the lab this week, remember the lab this week, you took some sodium chloride and you put it in plain water. And you took the temperature of the water before you put the sodium chloride in it, and you took the temperature of the water after you put the sodium chloride in it. What happened to the temperature of the water? The temperature of the water went down, right? The temperature of the water decreased. Now, I'm not talking about the thing that had the ice in it. We're talking only about water, liquid water from the tap, plain water. You add salt to it, make it add 10 grams, and the temperature went down, sometimes almost as much as a whole degree, right? That is lattice energy. Why did the temperature of the water go down? When you dissolve the salt in it. To break the lattice, the crystal lattice structure, the sodium and chlorine, took that energy. That energy came from the temperature of the water that then decreased. So it took some cue from the water, this idea of lattice energy. We could measure lattice energy if we could figure out what exactly what a mole of salt is. Dissolve it in water, we could look at and we could quantify the amount of energy that was absorbed. Well, if we look at these two compounds, we know that the amount of energy that would be absorbed would be different because they're different compounds. Sodium is a plus one, and chlorine is a minus one, where calcium is a plus two, and chlorine is a minus one. Let's just look at the effect that the charges would have on the lattice energy. Now, keep it in mind, this number doesn't change, right? K doesn't change, so we can kind of ignore that, right? Because it's a constant, it doesn't change. So we can then just look at those variables, how they're going to affect the lattice energy. If I have something like a plus one and a minus one, when I multiply them together, what's the product? It's just one, right? Plus one. 
if I have a plus two in the oh, excuse me, it's minus one. Excuse me. Sorry about that. I have my algebra wrong. Right? If I have a plus two and a minus one, I can divide them together. What's the product of that? Minus two. All right. So if we have minus one in the numerator position versus minus two in the numerator position, we know that number doesn't change. How is that going to affect the amount of energy? Minus one versus minus two. It's going to make the energy requirement a lot more, right? When that number goes up, that value is going to increase, right? So if I have something like two thirds versus three thirds, right? When that numerator value goes up, the product overall, or excuse me, the quotient overall, this is 0.66, this is one, right? So that value goes up as that number increases. Let's think about distance between the nuclei. Distance between the nuclei. Now, in this case, they're both hooked up to chlorine, right? So chlorine is a good control here. It's about the same size. But if we're looking at sodium versus calcium, who's going to be bigger? Calcium's going to be a lot bigger. So if we say chlorine is small, right? I'm going to represent chlorine is small in this bond. Calcium is going to be a lot bigger, the distance to the middle of that atom, versus the distance to the middle of sodium is going to be a lot smaller. So this distance is small, right? This distance is larger. How is that going to affect the amount of energy that it takes to break it up? If that number gets bigger, if D gets bigger, what's going to happen to the amount of energy? It's going to go down, which doesn't that make sense? It's easier to break up a compound whose atoms are further apart from each other and you're not feeling that effect of the charge than it is to break up a group of atoms that are closer together. So what you need to know of Coulomb's law is that as the charges of the ions increase, what happens to lattice energy? It increases, which makes sense. It's going to take more energy to, take a, uh, to break up a compound that has a one plus two minus one charge between it than it does to break up a compound that has a plus one minus one charge between it. Second thing is, as distance increases, that D increases, what's going to happen to my lattice energy value? It's going to decrease, right? So the further apart they are from each other, then the lattice energy is going to decrease for that particular compound. The next slide shows us some values that show that to be true. Look at the first three values here for the compound. Let me get this looking a little bit bigger. All right, lithium fluoride, lithium chloride, and lithium iodide. That's a good controlled experiment because they're all hooked up to lithium, which is a relatively small atom. Now if we look at the sizes of the things that are hooked up to it, fluorine, chlorine, or iodine, how do those sizes change on the periodic table? How do fluorine, chlorine, and iodine change as you go top to bottom on the periodic table? Nice. Here's fluorine, chlorine, and iodine. Iodine is bigger. Fluorine is smaller. So if we look back at our table of ionization energies, what's happening to the value of the lattice energy? Gets less, right? Which makes sense because the things that lithium is hooked up to are getting bigger, so they're getting farther away, so it's going to be easier to dissociate it. All right, let's look at another comparison. Here we've got magnesium chloride, and we've got a sodium chloride here. All right, sodium and magnesium are right next to each other. Let's see, is there a calcium chloride here? Hmm, well, magnesium and strontium. All right, magnesium and strontium are good ones to compare. Magnesium and strontium, if I look on the periodic table, they're both hooked up to chlorines. If I look at magnesium and strontium, they're right above each other. Same family, who's going to be bigger? Strontium is going to be bigger. So that bigger strontium is going to be increasing the D value. So strontium is going to be bigger. So what happens to the lattice energy? It goes down, right? All right. I think you guys get the idea. All right. Finally, we get to this last slide about antibodies. The energetics of antibodies. I'm going to talk to you about this slide about how we're to sodium, metal, and chlorine gas. We added it together. The energetics of removing the electron and adding the electron didn't make sense. Right? And we look and we simply add the energetics of removing and, and adding, it should be an endothermic reaction. We shouldn't have to add heat energy when, in fact, it's just the opposite. If you look here, 
This is the places where we're starting, the sodium and the chlorine gas. And when we end up, we have the sodium chloride solid. So here it shows that it is an exothermic reaction, right? The overall energetics. But that doesn't show <clears throat> the individual steps. That just shows the overall exothermicity. The first individual step is when you take sodium solid and you change it to sodium gas. See where I'm starting here at this energy level? I'm going up an energy level, so did I have to add energy, or am I going to get energy back as a result of moving up an energy? I have to do what here? I have to add some energy, which makes sense. To change a solid into a gas, you're going to have to put some energy in, right? All right. So now I've got gaseous sodium, sodium and my chlorine gas, and now I'm taking the chlorine molecule, which is Cl2, and I'm breaking it up into individual component atoms. Once again, that makes sense that it's going to require some energy to break up the chlorine molecule into individual chlorine atoms. So this is an endothermic reaction. This is another endothermic reaction. Now this reaction, we already know the energetics of. Remember, this was the, what was it, the plus 350, I think it was, that we looked at. 349, it was something like that. To rip the electron off of sodium is going to cost you 349 kilojoules per mole. When chlorine accepts that electron, you get back some amount less, right? So this is the amount less that you get back when you have to you know, you rip the electron off. It costs you that much. When it goes back onto chlorine, you get that much energy back. Then finally, when the sodium that is gaseous and the chlorine that is gaseous now combine together, there's where the hugely exothermic portion of this reaction is. And it actually takes over and encompasses the whole reaction, making it completely exothermic. So this idea of ionic bonding is also explained with the octet rule that where that stair-step line went down had to do with when you were taking electrons off of noble gases. Okay, so we're done. We are finished speaking about ionic structures, lab energy, now, we're going to talk about covalent bonding, which is the two molecules, right? Like carbon dioxide or water molecules. These are the ones that we talk about molecular geometry. Of. And molecular geometry influences the types of compounds that they are. In this particular slide, they're showing you the difference here between two bonds. So here's the two bonds of any sort of covalent compound. Now remember in an ionic compound you have electrons that transfer from the metal to the nonmetal, creating an electrostatic difference that holds it together. In a covalent bond, the electrons spend time around both of the atoms. They're not transferred from one to another. They spend time around both atoms and so that's what holds the whole thing together. So the nuclei are repulsed by each other as are the electrons, but the nuclei and the electrons are attracted to one another. So that goes back to this idea of Coulomb's law. Let's revisit Coulomb's law quickly. The Coulomb's law can be positive or negative. Look at Coulomb's law one more time. And we look at Q1 versus Q2. All right. If Q1 and Q2 are oppositely charged particles, right? When you multiply oppositely charged particles, what is my E value going to be? It's going to be negative. All right. So if the E value is negative, that means that um, attractive forces are in play. Right? Because when you have a positive and negative, a positive and negative, and those them together, you're going to get always a negative sum. So when the E value is negative, that means attractive forces are in play. Conversely, if I have two positively charged pieces or two negatively charged pieces together, when I multiply those, what do I always get? Something that's positive. So if your E value is positive, that says that we have repulsive forces are at work in that particular case. And that's what this particular graphic, the, art, the author is trying to show you, that there's repulsive and, and attractive forces between electrons and the nuclei of different atoms. This representation shows you the electron cloud. If that is a nuclei and that is a nuclei, that the electrons are distributed very densely around both nuclei and in between, <laughs> and then the density decreases as you go further and farther away from the nuclei. All right, which brings us to this idea of polar covalent bonds, which we did talk about last week in molecular geometry lab. 
and you can have polar covalent bonds and you can have nonpolar covalent bonds, right? Here's a good example of a nonpolar covalent bond. And this, the author here in this slide has shown us that the polar bond is represented by an unequal sharing. One side of the bubble is bigger because fluorine in the hydrofluoric acid molecule is going to be more electronegative. It's going to be greedier for those electrons. They're going to spend more time around fluorine than in hydrogen. And in this case, when fluorine is bonded to itself, they're both very electronegative, so they both want to hang on to those electrons, but they're both really strong. right? So you've got a wimpy atom and a strong atom sharing electrons. The strong one's going to hog them more. Here you got two strong atoms sharing electrons, and they both pull on it about the same. So polar covalent bond, this is the notation that they use, that they got a largely negative side over here and a positive side here. And electronegativity, we already talked about that trend. That creates more and more polar bonds. So the hydroiodic bond is not as polar as the hydrofluoric bond, which is much more polar because fluorine is more electronegative. And then, of course, we've already done lots of Lewis structures, including resonance with molecular geometry. So we're going to skip right through that and get on to covalent bond strength. Now, in comparison to lattice energy, remember lattice energy is in reference to ionic bonds. Now we're talking about covalent bonds. The strength of the covalent bond is measured in this idea of bond enthalpy, which is different than lattice energy. All right, bond enthalpies are per individual bond, not how much it's going to cost you to break up a mole of that stuff, but how much it's going to cost you to break up a mole of those bonds specifically. So this is a table of average bond enthalpies. And their averages, some of them are slightly different, some slightly more, some slightly less, depending on what they're hooked up to, but they're averages. And this tells us the enthalpy of the reaction. And the, the key part is this part here. We already talked a little bit about the fact that it's going to cost you energy to break a bond and then you get energy back. What we want to do now is we're going to take this particular reaction and we're going to use that reaction to show not only those structures, how we can use them, but also how we can use that table of average bond enthalpy. All right, so I'm going to move this aside a little bit so we can see the chemistry. So we got methane gas, which is CH4. As a gas, this one first part of the reaction is combining with chlorine gas, Cl2, as a 
as gas. See on the slide right here, the methane gas and the chlorine gas are combining together. This is a portion of the reaction that's an intermediate portion. And when you're done, you get two new kinds of gases, CH3Cl as a gas, plus the second kind of gas is HCl. All right, so overall, it looks like it is, is that an endothermic reaction or is that an exothermic reaction based on this energy diagram? Okay, so it talks, it's it, it going to require some energy to get to this point, right? you got to put energy in, but then you get some energy out. It looks like you get more energy out than what you put in, so what would that be, exo or endo? Exothermic. All right, let's do the calculations. Oh, before we can do the calculations, I'm going to flip back one slide because we're going to need this table of average bond enthalpies. This will appear in Chapter 8 in your book. It's also in this slide, and we're going to need it in order to do the calculations. All right. In order to do the calculations, what you have to do is you have to have Lewis structures for each of the individual molecules first. So I'm going to go over these relatively quickly because you all want to do it. Carbon has four valence electrons. Each hydrogen has one. There's four of them. A total of eight valence electrons. So we're going to put the CH4 molecule together. How we look at that? We go, oh, that looks like tetrahedral to me, right? So that zero molecule or zero electrons remain. If I look at chlorine, each chlorine has seven, that's a total of 14. Chlorine and chlorine come together, minus two leaves me 12. <coughs> I can distribute six electrons per atom and achieve my octet without having to use any double bonds. Now you can see here that if I had had, for example, O2 as a molecule, O2 has double bonds. And so you would have to look up the bond enthalpy of a double bond between oxygens versus a single bond of oxygen. So that's why it's important to know the Lewis structure for each of the molecules that you're going to be breaking up. Now we're on the peroxide, CH3Cl. Carbon has four valence electrons. Each hydrogen has one. There's three of them. And that extra chlorine there contributes seven. So I have a total of 14. I'm going to put C in the middle. CO on one side, hydrogen, hydrogen, and hydrogen, right? And I don't want to hook it up like that because each hydrogen can only have one opportunity to bond, and chlorine only has one opportunity to bond, and carbon has got four. So I'm going to put carbon in the middle. I take away two, four, six, eight electrons. That leaves me with a six, which means I'm going to put those six there for chlorine. And finally, hydrochloric. <laughs> hydrogen has one, chlorine has seven, that's a total of eight. Hydrogen and chlorine looks like this. Okay, so now I've got my Lewis structures. Now I've got to look at all the bonds I'm going to break versus all the bonds I'm going to make based on this formula right here. See, bonds broken. It's sort of like Hess's law, but not really. All right, so we got to look at it and compare bonds broken to bonds made. All right, so it costs me energy to break the bonds. So the bonds I'm going to be breaking, I'm going to put a little red dot, one, two, three, four. I have to break those four bonds. So my um, delta H, right, is going to be the sum of the bonds broken. So in this case, I've got carbon-hydrogen bonds that I need to break. So I look up here on my table of bond enthalpies, and can you see up there the carbon-hydrogen bond? It costs you 413 kilojoules per mole. And since I have... Four of them times the 413 kilojoules per mole, right? It's going to cost me four times 413 to break up that whole molecule. I also have to break up chlorine. If I look at the chlorine chlorine double bond, if I look over at my table, or excuse me, thank you, chlorine-chlorine single bond, there it is right there, chlorine-chlorine single bond is 242 kilojoules per mole of energy. So I have to add that. 242 kilojoules per mole. All right, so there's the bonds broken. Now we're going to subtract the energy of the bonds made. Well, now I've got one, two, three of those carbon-hydrogen bonds that I have to make. So now I'm making three of those. Remember we decided they were 413 kilojoules per mole each. But then I also have to make this carbon-chlorine bond. If I look at my table of bond enthalpies, the 
carbon chlorine bond, single bond, is right here. Carbon chlorine looks like 328 kilojoules per mole. So I'm going to add that, 328 kilojoules per mole. So I've done that. Now I have to only add my H and CL bond right there. So I'm going to add these here. I look at my table of bond enthalpies. And where the heck is HCl? Where, there it is, HCl 431. All right, so 431. All right, now with your calculators, you're going to add all those numbers up. You're going to add all those numbers up. You're going to take the sum of those, minus reaction this way if you want. Look at how their calculations are different. Let me explain those to you. What they did was they said, all right, if I look at this reaction, really how CH4 is changing is it's only really breaking that one bond right there, right? So that one bond, that one CH bond is broken. So that's why the author said it's only taking, they're only going to take one of those CH3 carbon hydrogen bonds there. All right. They also look at the fact that you got to break that bond for sure. So they added the 242. Then they're going to subtract the other values, this, and they only subtract the values that they're making. The problem with doing it this way is that sometimes you miss things, right? The numbers will come out exactly the same, but if you do it this way, you might miss some things. If you do it the way that I showed you, you're definitely not going to miss anything because if you break everything up and then you make everything, you won't miss anything. All right. The last one, all you need to know on this slide is as you get more bonds between atoms, the distance between them decreases. So single bonds are furthest away from each other. Double bonds are closer. Triple bonds are closest of all. All right. We are done.